Um, okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming to my talk, uh, especially the last presentation before lunch. I know that's rough. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm not sure if he mentioned the title, but it's a project involving treatment of an Angelman syndrome mouse model with the ketone ester. So first of all, I wanted to focus why specifically um, we fo can you hear me? People look like they, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, why we decided to specifically focus on the treatment of Angelman syndrome. It's a rare neurological disorder with a prevalence of about one in 15 to one in 20,000. And first, Angelman syndrome is involved, it's a monogenic disorder. It's involving a single housekeeping gene, UBE3A, which is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And somehow this is causing many of the neurological defects that we see in Angelman syndrome patients, such as developmental delay, speech impairment, motor problems such as ataxia or tremor, seizures, and a characteristic abnormal EEG. Secondly, AS is considered to be a disorder of epilepsy, with greater than 80% of individuals with AS being diagnosed with seizures. And lastly, Angelman syndrome is a relatively new disorder, at least in the realm of research. While it was first described by Dr. Harry Angelman in 1965, it wasn't until 1998 that the first mouse model was created. And so it's been 18 years where a lot of research has been done and we have progressed pretty well. However, there is still no cure for this disorder. So I want to focus a little bit more about specifically uh, epilepsy in AS. Like I mentioned previously, greater than 80% of individuals with AS are diagnosed with seizures. And typically they're diagnosed within their first year of life, typically having over 100 seizures per day. And at least by age three, almost all of them are diagnosed with seizures. Unfortunately, they're commonly admitted to the hospital due to being in status. And sadly, seizures are a common cause of death in this patient population. I've listed many of the common seizure types here, but there are a few more. But however, the origin of seizures in AS is currently unknown. Additionally, intractable epilepsy is very common in AS. Um, they are refractory to many medications, and unfortunately, this has been linked to both hippocampal damage, hippocampal damage, sorry, and cognitive decline if not well controlled. I would consider some of the current treatments in AADs today to be ineffective simply because there are so many intractable cases in AS specifically. And additionally, these AADs have a lot of cognitive and motor-related side effects, which is less than ideal in a patient population that already has severe cognitive and motor-related issues. So I'm going to go into just a little bit of detail about the AS mouse model that I used for this study. Um, this was, again, the one that was created in 1998. It's a null mutation model that inactivates all UBE3A isoforms. The mouse does recapitulate the phenotype seen in humans with AS pretty well. They have a audiogenic seizure phenotype. And they also, with, uh, like with the adenosine receptor mice, they also have, when you look at EEGs, they have spontaneous seizures even though you do not see behavioral seizures. There are also learning and memory deficits, synaptic plasticity deficits, and uh, motor impairment problems. And this can be seen throughout a vast array of behavioral testing, um, some of which I've listed here. So I would like to discuss with you just a little bit about differences in strain, simply because I did use two different strains in this study. First, the C57 Black 6 strain, which is very well characterized and is capable of complex learning over multiple tasks. So this was primarily for a lot of behavioral testing, while the 129 animals have the inducible audiogenic seizure phenotype, but they don't perform as well on those tests. So I know this is a lot of text, but I'm going to go through it all. Um, this is some of the recent research that's showing an ex excitatory inhibitory imbalance in the AS brain. This could be a reason why there's overall hyperexcitability in the brain and could be tied to the seizure aspect. First, uh, it was seen in the cortex, in the L2, L3 cortical pyramidal neurons specifically, that there was a decrease in inhibitory or in excitatory inputs, but a resulting more significant decrease in inhibitory drive onto these neurons. So this created this excitatory inhibitory imbalance and an overall increased excitation or decrease in inhibition. So this can lead to a decreased signal to noise ratio, which can obviously affect uh, detection and integration of sensory information. Moving into another region of the AS brain or the AS mouse brain was the cerebellum. They noted, a group noted 160 hertz fast oscillations in the cerebellum and you typically see about 30 to 80. Another group saw decreased tonic inhibition in cerebellar granule cells. This same group saw increases in GAT1, a GABA transporter, suggesting there would be decreased GABA in the area. So what they did was administer a GABA agonist called THIP, IP to the mice. 
and they did see that they that improved abnormal Purkinje cell firing and also significantly improved the ataxic phenotype seen in the AS mice. Moving into the human AS brain, uh, it was reported in a case study in 1991 that there was a decrease in cerebellar GABA and an increase in cortical glutamate. Again, all of this tying into that idea of an excitatory inhibitory imbalance, potentially. So the next step was to look at novel AS therapeutics, potentially with fewer side effects, that could increase tonic inhibition by increasing things like the GABA to glutamate ratio or just by increasing overall GABAergic output. So many of you have seen this, and I know there are lots of potential anticonvulsant mechanisms of the diet. We know that definitely. But just for the purposes of this project, I wanted to focus on one specific aspect, being the increased GABAergic output. And so, um, as we know, ketone bodies can come, can generate acetyl-CoA, which enters the TCA cycle via this synthase pathway, which uses a lot of oxaloacetate and makes it less available for transamination of glutamate to aspartate. The idea here is that potentially there could be more glutamate available for the synthesis of GABA um, by a de uh, glutamic acid decarboxylase. Additionally, ketone bodies and astrocytes would uh, result in the production of glutamine, and that's also an important precursor for GABA. So looking specifically at the ketogenic diet and the use of the ketogenic diet in Angelman syndrome, there was a review that reported 100% success in children, for children ages 5 to 8, but there weren't really many details, just saying they reduced their AEDs and they had, it had anticonvulsant activity. But there were two reported case studies. One was an 18-month-old and the second was a 5-year-old, both with intractable seizures. They were refractory to at least uh, three AEDs, and the 18-month-old was having hundreds of seizures a day. The 5-year-old, what was really interesting after initiation of the ketogenic diet, within two days they were completely seizure-free. And so they ended up doing a long-term study with the 5-year-old, um, and they, this 5-year-old was ultimately reduced to one AED in the ketogenic diet. And this is just an example of the um, EEGs of this 5-year-old before ketogenic diet initiation and two years following. And you can see a lot of the uh, epileptiform activity and slow wave complexes and a more normalized EEG two years following that ketogenic diet. And this chart was provided to me by Dr. Douglas Nordley. He's a neurologist in Chicago who comes into contact with this patient population very frequently. So this has just been his personal experience with the various seizure types seen in AS and potential seizure treatments. And I really just wanted to focus on two things here, the ones that seem to be the most effective against the most seizure types, the ketogenic diet and valproate. And again, you can see most effective. Um, again, we were trying to look for something that potentially wouldn't have the same type of side effects as valproate. But unfortunately, with the ketogenic diet, um, individuals with AS have GI issues sometimes, they have, trouble, they have difficulty gaining weight, and lastly, they often have sensory issues, so they're sensitive to smell, taste, so they can be pretty picky eaters. So we wanted to find something that mimicked the ketogenic diet, um, potentially having neuroprotective effects, but we could just add it to their standard diet without ultimately affecting their overall dietary intake. So we decided to utilize a ketone ester that was provided to us by Dr. Diagostino. Um, this was the RS13-butane diol diacetoacetate ester, and it has been shown to induce therapeutic ketosis in both dogs and pigs, and has significant, significantly delayed CNS oxygen toxicity seizures. So the hypothesis here was that this ketone ester would positively affect a lot of the phenotypes in the AS mouse model, including decreasing seizure frequency and increasing the latency to seize, potentially improving learning and memory and the motor impairments and synaptic plasticity in the AS mouse model. So what we did was we provided the ketone ester, administered the ketone ester at 10% of the total volume of their standard tech lab diet. We wanted to get to 30 to 40%, that was the goal, but in pilot studies with the more sensitive 129 animals, we started with 10 and 20%, and they did not tolerate the 20% diet very well. Um, it's a different story for the C57s, but just for consistency's sake, we stuck with the 10% total volume. Um, we fed them ad libitum for eight weeks, and took blood from the tip of the tail one time per week for both beta-hydroxybutyrate and glucose measurements. Anytime you're gonna see any of this data, um, there's typically about eight to 12 animals per group, and they were two to three months of age, so these were adult mice. We performed behavioral testing, seizure testing, and this included the uh, induced audiogenic seizures. We administered 115 decibel white noise um, until they seized for a maximum of 60 seconds. 
And we also administered canic acid at 20 milligrams per, ki per kilogram for chemically induced seizures as well. We performed hippocamp hippocampal electrophysiological testing, specifically LTP, and also performed metabolic analyses. So starting with the 129 data, first what you're looking at here is open field and elevated plus. Um, you're looking at wild type, AS non-treated, wild type treated, and AS treated. And just this, there are no differences between groups, and this is just suggesting no differences in general locomotor activity or anxiety, which is not going to negatively affect any of the behaviors that you will see next. So we wanted to focus on um, a memory task, and this was object recognition memory. And a wild type animal is typically going to want to explore a novel object compared to an old object more often. And so what you see here is exploratory preference, and 50% is considered chance. So these animals here are all spending time with the novel object. So you see a deficit in exploratory preference with the AS animals with a significant improvement or increase in, expo in exploration in the novel object with the AS treated animals, suggested, suggesting enhanced object recognition memory. And this is just another way of showing the data, but you can see how much time they spent with the old object compared to a novel object. It's just a ratio, and anything below zero means they actually spent more time with the old object. So not only are they spending less time with the novel, but they're spending a little bit more time with the old, while all of these animals are spending more time with the new object. So moving into more motor-related data and the taxic phenotype. First, we looked at the rotor rod, and this is an accelerated rotor rod. Um, it accelerates from 4 to 40 RPMs over the course of five minutes. And what we look at is the latency to fall off the rod. So you see wild type animals are here and AS animals are here and they have a significant uh, decrease in latency to fall off the rod and we see a significant improvement in our AS treated animals, suggesting improvements in motor coordination. So we want to explore the motor phenotype a little bit more thoroughly and look at something that tests subacute muscle function or fatigue. And this is the wire hang task. And so this is where you have a thin wire, place the animals with their two front paws on the wire and let them hang on until they fall off or for a maximum of 60 seconds. And what we saw here, again, was a significant decrease in the latency to fall in our AS animals with a significant improvement to, uh, or increased latency to fall in our AS treated animals comparable to wild type. And lastly, what we wanted to look at was the hind limb clasping reflex. And this is uh, something we typically see a higher score in our AS animals and is just a uh, measure of neurologic function and you typically also see a higher score in mice with cerebellar ataxias. So what we do here is lower the animal by its tail for 10 seconds and what you do is look for a score from 0 to 3. And what you see in wild type animals are the hind limbs consistently splayed outward away from the abdomen. And this is an example of a wild type animal. A score of 1 is where one hind limb is retracted toward the abdomen. A two, both hind limbs are partially retracted towards the abdomen. And three, both hind limbs are entirely retracted, touching the abdomen, and typically in this clasping form. And what we saw was a significant improvement in our AS-treated animals in this hind limb clasping score. Again, all of this suggesting an overall motor improvement. So next we looked at synaptic plasticity. And what our lab and Dr. Weber has seen previously is a deficit in following theta burst stimulation in uh, LTP in our AS animals compared to wild type. And what we saw was enhanced LTP, or at least rather not as significantly impaired LTP compared to AS animals. And this is without changes in basal synaptic transmission or short-term short synaptic plasticity. So this was very interesting to see uh, normalization or a change in synaptic function. So moving into the seizure data, I wanted to let you know how we actually scored the canic acid seizures. We used a modified Racine scale going from stage zero to stage seven. So you go through things like immobility, repetitive movements like head bobbing, rearing and falling, which is an example of the mice doing so here, rearing on their hind limbs and falling over. Um, there can also be continuous rearing and falling, and then they can lose posture and have severe whole body convulsions and sometimes death. So starting with the audiogenic seizure data, what we saw was a decrease in just the overall seizure frequency and then an increase or a significant increase in the AS treated animals in the latency to seize. Again, suggesting we're somehow affecting overall inhibition and improving um, the seizure phenotype. For canic acid seizures, uh, we didn't see uh, consistency throughout the entire test, but we did see a delay in the severity of the onset of canic acid seizures. Again, we're somehow affecting inhibition. And again, all of us showing this is potentially anticonvulsant in our AS mouse model. And this was just to show wild type and AS treated animals at baseline, week one and week eight, just throughout the course of the study that there were significant increases in beta hydroxybutyrate.
suggesting our ketone ester is working as expected. So then moving on into the C57 data, and these are not the seizure-prone animals. Uh, looking at the group weights, typically the C57's AS animals are actually overweight, which some of the AS children are as well. And we actually saw a normalization of weight in our AS-treated animals. And again, similar to what we saw in the 129s, significant increases in beta-hydroxybutyrate throughout the course of the study. So here looking at open field again, no general differences in locomotor activity. And what we saw was with the wire hang task, we saw a trend towards improvement in subacute muscle function, but not a significant change like we saw in the 129 animals. And this is just an example of wild type animals performing the task. They can actually pull up and are strong enough to pull and hold on with all four limbs, while this is the AS animal that struggles quite a bit. So looking at the hind limb clasping score, we again saw significant improvement, a decrease in the clasping score in the AS treated animals. And in the rotor rod, throughout the course of the test, we saw a significant increase in latency to fall in AS-treated animals, like we saw with the 129s, suggesting increases or improvements in both motor coordination and motor learning. But this was not as drastic as what we saw in the 129s, if you remember. Again, though, this is still sh suggesting overall improvements in both motor and neurologic function. So then moving into uh, a memory task in the C57 animals. So what we looked at was associative learning, or a fear conditioning paradigm. And this was using a condition unconditioned stimulus. This was the tone foot shock, two foot shock paradigm. And we were looking at as percent freezing. And this is to see ultimately if they will end up remembering um, the, the, stimulus, the stimulus. So at the first day, they both, or the all groups, trained to the same extent. And 24 hours later, you put them in the same context to see if they remembered and look at their percent freezing. We saw a significant decrease in percent freezing in our AS animals with a significant improvement comparable to wild type in our AS treated animals. And this is hippocampal dependent. While cued fear conditioning, you put them in a different context and you have them in there for three minutes with no tone and three minutes with the tone. And we typically don't see deficits in our AS treated animals and we saw no differences in freezing throughout all of the groups. But again, all of this suggests improvements in associative learning. So I know there's a lot of data to throw at you, so I just wanted to show uh, a summary and point out a couple important things and consistencies between the two strains. Uh, improvements in learning and memory tasks and improvements in um, significant motor improvements over multiple tasks. And this is very important for the, this patient population who often they can't even walk. So um, I just wanted to point that out. So then moving into the metabolic analyses. So we looked in the plasma um, for at both we looked for both beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, seeing increases in both uh, the wild type and AS-treated animals. And then what we wanted to look at was the GABA to glutamate ratio. And we specifically looked in the hippocampus and saw significant increases in our AS-treated animals um, compared to AS-non-treated. So this is suggesting we're increasing tonic inhibition. And if you look really closely, you'll see that there's a difference, but very similar results in our C57 animals in the hippocampus. Increased beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate in the plasma, and a significant increase in the GABA to glutamate ratio. And this is just uh, data that's, it's been suggested that obviously if you're increasing GABA, potentially you should be inc increasing glutamic acid decarboxylase, potentially. So I looked at both GAD65 and 67 in the hippocampus and the cerebellum and either saw trends or significant increases in both GAD65 and 67 in both the cerebellum and the hippocampus. So, in summary, over eight weeks of ketone ester treatment, we saw increased beta-hydroxybutyrate levels throughout treatment, suggesting the ketone ester was working as expected. It was anticonvulsant in our mouse model, normalized weights in C57, our C57 mice. We saw motor improvements, as you can see by the rotor rod, wire hang, and clasping score. We saw memory improvements in the object recognition and associative memory tasks, and also enhanced synaptic plasticity. For the metabolic analyses, we saw both increased beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate in the plasma, and an overall increase in the GABA to glutamate ratio in the hippocampus. So for the next step, we would like to perform more extensive metabolic analyses, look at TCA cycle intermediates and a few other things, and we'd also like to increase the uh, total volume of the diet, especially for the C57s who tolerate the diet very well. We've also placed these mice in metabolic cages, and we need to analyze that data. And so overall, this uh, ketone ester could be used as a treatment in AS, or at least with s something else, but overall could have efficacy in treating seizure frequency and threshold, which could affect cognition in our AS population. So I'd like to thank my lab and committee members for their support, our collaborators, Dr. Diagostino, 
and Case Western Reserve University for performing the metabolic analyses. And if you have any other questions other than what you have now, I'm at poster A6 tonight. And are there any questions? I have two questions. Thank you. It was a great talk. Um, one is, um, can you further elucidate on the weight loss? Was that despite ad lib? Yes, that was despite ad lib. And this is the, something that Angela, I thought, saw. And there are a few things that they've thought about. One is increasing melanocoA, I believe, which is an anorexigenic, so it's going to decrease appetite. That's potential. And I know um, the insulin sensitivity is another potential for all of this, tying into this. So they, it has been reported. She did publish on this before. She did see a decrease in, in weight and in glucose. So. It could be that power too. Yes. Yeah, ten, to see all these results with 10% was actually pretty, yeah. You know, what would happen if we had 20, 30, even 40% ketone ester? We're not, you know, it's not palatable to have that at this time to increase the dose that we think we might see greatly enhanced effects, potentially. And that was something I wanted to look at was food intake, which is why I did the metabolic cages. But you have to do, with that, we need to have it in pellet form or something else because, yeah, it's just the mush. So that's, that's something I would like to look at, definitely, though. Thank you. And secondly, are you doing a human trial? Are you planning a pilot? I think that's the plan. Okay. That is the plan. <laughs> yes. So a question and a comment. So the only evidence you have for augmented GAP or gene nerve transmission is the GAD expression. Right. The problem with GAD expression is that it doesn't necessarily reflect true GABA levels. Right. Because you have higher turnover rates again and maybe low and things like that. So so that's why we did do, do the GABA to glutamate ratio specifically in the hippocampus. We did do that uh, metabolic analysis and it wasn't a, an overall significant increase in GABA, but again, that's why we looked at the ratio, but we would need more mice and have to perform more metabolic analyses. Have we thought about doing some hair pulse uh, experiments? Um, so I did do PPF um, and I actually did not see this is suggesting that it's potentially not working by that mechanism, but I do have that data, and it does not seem like there's a significant difference uh, in PPF.